about is how to deterministic and local interpretation of quantum mechanics possible. First steps, whatever. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Oscar Rosas for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, and I have to tell you that in his written invitation, he explicitly asked me to talk about this topic, uh, which, is, which is rather strange. It's strange for two reasons. First, it's not my line of research. It's just uh, something, some small work that I did on the side with a student of mine, uh, Natalia sanchez Kunz, who is now at the University of Heidelberg. And uh, secondly, because I don't even know how on earth he knew that I had worked on this. <laughs> but anyway, he explicitly said, please come and talk about this topic. So I thought uh, about it for uh, one day, and uh, a full day. <laughs> and then I said to myself, well, I've talked about quantum optics in all other conferences. So uh, this, this will be sort of more, uh, uh, more controversial and, uh, and more fun. Right? So I said, I answered him in the affirmative, and, and here I am. Uh, and, uh, let me just say why this is more controversial. It's more controversial because, as Dirac once said, uh, there's nothing that, that physicists like, like most than to hear that what they already know. Right? And it's true. We have a theory that works, and it's very precise. We don't like you know, people coming and telling us uh, that uh, it can be a little bit uh, you know, weird or managed somehow. Uh, so uh, I will ask you to, to please put aside all your prejudices, only for the length of this talk. And I wouldn't dare to ask you to put them aside forever. Right? And then after the talk, you can you can clothe yourself with them again uh, and, and and live peacefully. <laughs> so uh, to the purpose and so to the venture. Um, we all know that the 20th century gave us two theories that uh, have accompanied uh, us uh, for as, as, as long as we're here. And uh, they have been the most important physical theories. But in spite of all their great successes, not everything has been, has been very kind and smooth. Uh, we know that relativity and quantum mechanics cannot be applied at the same time. To do the same problem, and when one tries to do so, one arrives to, to contradictions, and these contradictions arise from the very foundation of each of them. Uh, uh, we have locality, causality, and determinism in relativity, and on the other hand, we have entanglement, anti-causal events, and a probabilistic interpretation of the results in, in quantum mechanics. Uh, so. I come from, from the area of relativity, so I strongly believe what, relati what special relativity tells us, and it is that uh, a local lo locality and causality are imposed on space-time as a result of the velocity of light being a limit and being finite. So this means that uh, uh, this event can, can only uh, affect anything that's inside the future light cone event, and it can only be affected by things that happened in the past light cone event. So these two events, for instance, the ones that are here in, in the red and yellow dots, uh, cannot have an effect one on another. And this is, this is something that, if we believe that, that, that we are in a space-time with a Lorentzian metric, then this has to happen. So, uh, this is just says exactly what to say. In contrast, uh, entanglement emerges in quantum mechanics when we have two or more particles that can only be described as a whole. We cannot describe each one uh, independently. And this seems to force the state of each particle to depend on the state of the other particle, even if they are widely separated. So even if this is in Andromeda and this is us, Furthermore, if we 
perform the same experiment repeatedly in quantum mechanics, we do not always get the same result. So it only provides us with statistical interpretation of what's going on. And this led to, to Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen uh, to the idea that quantum mechanics is not complete. And it needed to be completed with other variables that are not in the theory. And so they're called hidden variables. And uh, many years later, John Bell, trying to prove that, trying to prove that one could include hidden variables in quantum mechanics, uh, constructed an inequality which every theory containing all the hidden variables must satisfy, and then demonstrated that quantum mechanics violated this inequality. And thus, he was forced to conclude the possibility to explain non-local phenomena of quantum mechanics through local hidden variables. And this is what we all believe. So, strange as it may seem, quantum mechanics tells us that matter in some planet away from us might tell us how matter here with us in our vicinity should behave, regardless of how distant uh, this planet is, and furthermore, instantly. Uh, and what I want to show you is that Bell made a few assumptions to build his inequality that would not be true in a deterministic scenario. So if we add true determinism to the evolution of particles, then Bell's inequality cannot be derived. Uh, so in order to do that, the frame of thought that uh, I, I would ask you to, to have now is the following. Uh, first, quantum states in superposition cannot be observed. And this suggests that they merely embody information of what one could possibly measure. And yet we think of them as describing uh, physical systems that actually evolve uh, in time according to a certain or to certain mathematical equations. This evolution of, of <coughs> the evolution of these systems takes place in physical space-time. And as I mentioned, local causality is imposed on space-time by special relativity. And this is a sequence of cause and effects that actually constitutes a fundamental principle by which we think and we do scientific work. I do not know anybody who places his photon detector and tries to measure photons before turning on the laser, unless he's trying to measure uh, background noise, for instance. I also do not know any experimentalist who places the uh, stern garlic apparatus, for instance, not in his lab, but in the building opposite on the other street, uh, just in case the wave function collapses over there and not here. Right. So it's therefore very strange that there is no locality and violation of causality embedded in quantum mechanics. And uh, what I will try to, to do is to give a first step towards uh, a deterministic and local interpretation. So I'll show you that Bell's inequality is not conclusive uh, about the non-local nature of quantum mechanics, and that there exists an interpretation of reality, sorry, that there exists an interpretation of reality, which I will put forward, uh, which is local, and in which Bell's inequality cannot be derived. Um, and assuming determinism and locality, there is a new, uh, Bell-like inequality that can be derived and which is always satisfied in quantum mechanics and which allows for local hidden variables. This is this is the uh, the objective of this book. So let let me review briefly the uh, EPR argument. So they consider two particles prepared in this state, where x1 and x2 are the position of the uh, of, of the two particles. X0 is just a constant here. Um, K here is uh, essentially momentum. And the eigenfunctions of momentum for each particle uh, 
uh, is this one here for the first particle and this one here for the second particle. So the state can be written as uh, this equation number two here. With this one has eigenvalue p and this one has eigenvalue minus p. So if you are thinking on uh, one particle, let's say a nucleus, which um, disintegrates into two particles and each one of them flies away in opposite directions. That's, that's the, the, uh, the Gedanken experiment they have. So we can also expand the state in eigenfunctions of, of position. We write the delta function like this, with s here just 2 pi times the exponent that we had beforehand. Uh, and we use this property of the delta function, and then we have we have this, this equality so that uh, the function for, for, of, of uh, position for the uh, second particle is just this delta function multiplied by h. That's the eigenfunction for position. And of course, the eigenfunction for position of the first particle is just delta x minus x1. And so we can write the state like this. So we have two different ways of writing this uh, state, as in equation 2 here or as in equation three here. One is the momentum representation and one is the position representation. And their argument is as follows. One can measure, one can choose to measure position of particle one. Let's say we get our results Q. And by equation three, we know that particle two is in this state with position minus Q plus X. But we can also choose at any moment to measure the momentum of particle we get a certain result, R. And by equation two, then particle two is in this state with momentum minus R. So without disturbing system two, we can predict with certainty its position or its momentum at any time. Therefore, position and momentum must have a simultaneous reality. Now, quantum mechanics does, quantum mechanics does not account for these two properties simultaneously, it is therefore incomplete. This was their argument. There is another uh, interpretation of the same, the same problem uh, put forward by, by Bohm, uh, in which uh, instead of using position and momentum, he uses position and spin, because it's easier to measure spin than to measure momentum. So we have this uh, initial particle with, let's say, uh, total spin zero. It uh, divides itself into two. They both, um, particles A and B, uh, follow a certain trajectory, and we measure their spin along a certain axis and along a different axis. And the measurement of one of them will completely determine what the other one will be. And uh, I ask, so what? So what? Because Bell himself gives us this, this picture here of uh, Professor Bertelmann. Professor B Bertelmann, he actually exists. And uh, <laughs> he's now retired, but uh, he was at the University of Vienna. And Bell tells us that he always used socks of different colors. So as Professor Bertelmann is walking by, let's say, this auditorium and passes by, and the door is open. And we have a look at one of his feet and we see that the color of the sock is, let's say, pink, we immediately know that the other one is not pink. Instantaneously. We don't need, you know, finite speed of light or anything. We instantaneously know that the other sock is not pink. Now, why? Because the correlation between the color of the socks was set beforehand. It was set in the past. He chose to wear socks of different colors. Um, forgetting about Professor Bertelmann and, and going towards uh, the spin of particles. Uh, if we think about spin being like little magnets with the North Pole and the South Pole, and we send uh, particles uh, through a variable magnetic field, and if these spins, if these magnets are oriented randomly, then we would expect 
to see this, this pattern on the screen. However, we see a pattern like this. And one might think, well, in the preparation of, the, of these, of these uh, particles, uh, or due to external fields or whatever, maybe there is a preferred orientation of the magnets, like this, instead of having all the orientations equally uh, distributed. Then we rotate the detector by pi over 2. And we still observe this. Just two little dots. And some eminent figures, like uh, the ones mentioned here, have uh, suggested that what's happening is that the properties are not there before the measurement. The observer produces the results when measuring. And this is in many books, even textbooks. But if, if that is so, then I ask why do socks choose different colors when looked at? Right? If the property was not there, if it was produced when I looked at it, why do they choose different colors? And the root of the problem is, of course, non-locality. Um, events on different places may be correlated. That causes, causes poses no problems. But the intervention, the intervention at one place should not immediately influence the other. At least not in a relativistic scenario, which is the one we live in. So if the two stern Gerlach apparatus uh, to which these subsystems travel, these particles travel, are oriented in the same direction, and the, the original particle had total spin zero, then we know that if one is deflected upwards, the other one will be deflected downwards, right? It's just conservation of spin. So that is already arranged in the past. Why in the past? Because we chose to send particles with total spin equal to zero. So if one of them has plus one half, the other one will have minus one half. Plus one and minus one. What happens if we do not orient them uh, parallelly? One of them is oriented at one angle and the other one is oriented at another angle. Let's call them A, lowercase a and lowercase b. Then the probability of both of them going up or both of them going down is given by a half sine square of the difference of the angles divided by two. And the probabilities of one going up and the other down is or just a half minus this other probability. So I will give you now a, a cartoon version of Bell's theorem, and then we'll go to, to Bell's theorem itself. Uh, let's say that we block one of the channels in the stir girl apparatus. We only allow particles to be deflected on them. Then I I affirm that the probability of particle one passing at angle zero, angle zero with respect to the vertical z direction, and the probability of particle two passing at 45 degrees, plus the probability of particle one passing at 45 degrees and particle two at 90, is greater than or equal to the probability of particle one passing at zero degrees and probability of particle two passing at 90 degrees. And to see why this is so, let me restate this for one particle, assuming an anti-correlation of the second particle. So this says that the probability of the particle to pass at 0 degrees, but not at 45, because particle 2 passed at 45 degrees. Particle 1 is anti-correlated, particle 2, so it doesn't pass at 45 degrees plus the probability to pass at 45 but not at 90 degrees should be greater than or equal to the probability to pass at 0 degrees and not at 90 degrees. And why this is so? Because if a particle is able to pass at 0 degrees but unable to pass at 90 degrees, so it's in this center, then it is either able to pass at 45, in which case it's in this set, or it is unable to pass this set. So any element on this set is in one of these two. So the union of these two sets is 
greater than or equal to this one. And that's why it, 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 it turns. Uh, this inequality holds. And um, however trivial this argument is, quantum mechanics does not respect this inequality. And if we use the equations I showed you before, uh, the probability of both going up is this here. We set a minus b to be pi, my pi over 4. And then the inequality will tell us that 0.1464 is uh, not greater than or equal to uh, 0.25. So this is, as I said, a cartoon version. Let me review briefly how Bell proved this. Um, uh, I will denote by, by uppercase letters the results obtained at the stern girdle apparatus. So A or B is just up and down, um, or plus or minus 1. And with lowercase letters, uh, I will denote the angle at which the apparatus is set. So this P of A, uh, uppercase A, lowercase A, is just the probability of obtaining the result A, up or down, when the apparatus is at an angle A. So it's just the probability of, of this result, where sigma is just the uh, vector spin operator. And of course, if we have anti-correlation of particles, that means that if sigma 1 dot A is plus 1, then sigma 2 dot A is minus 1. One particle is up, the other one is down uh, when we measure at the same angle A. And let P of AB given lowercase a b be the conditional probability of getting results A and B given angles lowercase a and lowercase b. And of course, because the subsystems are correlated, this is not just the product of these two probabilities, it's in general. Different. Now, suppose we measure uh, at remote places from one another the, 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 the uh, spin projection of the particle, and suppose that the orientation of one magnet does not influence the result from the other magnet. And let's suppose, of course, that our theory allows us to, um, uh, to, to calculate the result of the measurement. So, since the wave function cannot determine the result for an individual measurement, then uh, the possibility of doing so calls for uh, 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 extra hidden variables in order to have a, a more complete specification. So let's call these variables lambda. And these can be scalars, vectors, tensors. It doesn't really matter. It can be one. It can be many variables. And then if we introduce these variables, then, then we decorrelate the two subsystems. And now, the conditional probability can be expressed as the product of the independent probabilities. But now, this is the probability of getting result A, given an angle A, and other variables, which are hidden in the theory, called that, and so on. And then, um, this is what I, what I just said. Uh, uh, one important assumption, assumption is that the Result for B does not depend on A. The result for B only depends on angle B and the hidden variables. And the result for A does not depend on B. Uh, so we are really independent. That, that's the locality assumption that Bell does on the, uh, on the hidden variables. Um, let's uh, denote by rho of lambda the probability distribution of the values of lambda in the set where it takes its, its values, let's call that uh, capital lambda. And uh, then the expectation value of the correlation between measuring A at angle A or, and B at angle B is given by, by this equation here. And then Bell says, OK, let's take three measurements in different directions, lowercase a, b, and c. And let's calculate this one. This quantity is just uh, the absolute value of these two integrals 
uh, we can factorize this a over here. b squared is 1 because b is plus or minus 1, so we can also factorize it. And here we have a times b, which we had over here, and b squared is 1, so over here we have a times b at angles a and c, which is this term over here. We place the absolute value inside the integral sign, and that's what we get the, uh, the inequality over here. And then we use anti-correlation and we substitute b at angle b for a, sorry, minus b for plus a at angle b. And this is just 1 plus the expectation value of measuring at angle b and c. So Bell gets this inequality, this uh, uh, the subtraction of these two at an absolute value has to be less than or equal to 1 plus this expectation value. And quantum mechanically, if we just calculate this expectation value of, of the spin projections, we get minus the cosine of the difference of angle. Uh, yeah, I'm doing the same, the same. <laughs> thing. Yeah. I don't know if NAM has something to do with this. So, um, so we take the difference of of angles A and B to be pi over 2, of angles A and C to be pi over 4, angles B and C to be pi over 4, and we get a contradiction. We get square root of 2 less than or equal to 1. So this is the contradiction that Bell arrived, arrived at uh, doing, doing mathematically what I, I did in the cartoon beforehand. So Bell then concludes that quantum mechanics cannot be completed by and there are other no-go theorems that have existed uh, ever since Bell, by Clauser, Horn, Schumann, and Holt, by Paris, by Mermin, uh, the GHZ, that's Seidinger, uh, Greenberg, and Holt. Uh, and there's a, even a more recent result, uh, uh, which tells us that uh, if a system has a real physical state, not necessarily described by quantum theory, but it has a real physical state, objective and independent of the observer. And if systems that are prepared independently have independent physical states, then a pure state cannot be regarded as mere information. What we were, what we were taught in our first course of quantum mechanics, right? The, the, uh, the wave function is just information. There's nothing more. So they say a pure state cannot be regarded as mere information, or else one would arrive at a contradiction with the quantum theoretical. And this is a very strong theory. So what the assumptions are that there is reality, that the physical state is real, and that the wave function is not mere information. So apparently quantum theory does also away with realism, not only locality and causality. And, uh, and this is something a few of us don't like. So um, what we believe is that uh, the job of a scientist is to faithfully describe an objective universe that exists and what we live in. And if we're not allowed to suppose results for experiments that have not, have not been carried out, then that's equivalent to not being able to develop a scientific model. And as I said before, we also believe that evolution takes place uh, in physical space-time and local causality is imposed physical space too. So let us assume determinism and locality for a moment. Okay, let's, let's go back to, to what we were taught when we were really young. Not, not at university, but younger. Now, um, this is just, uh, 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 for completeness, just a few definitions. Uh, we define a quantum state to be a state generated from linear combinations of different eigenstates of an observable. Uh, we denote them with a lowercase psi. We define an ontological state to be the eigenstate of a complete set of mutually commuting observables and denote them by uh, uppercase omega. And an ontological pair to be that which emerges due to the interaction between two physical entities. Let's say a 
system and the measuring apparatus or, or two electrons or whatever. And uh, let's consider the singlet state that was considered in the bomb experiment. So we have a particle uh, initially of the spin, total spin zero. It splits into two, one travels in one direction, one travels in the opposite direction due to conservation of momentum. Uh, each of these reaches a detector and we measure its spin projection in a certain, in a certain angle. So each individual system, the apparatus and the subparticle, is an ontological pair which will evolve according to a certain function of a hidden variable at time t. A hidden variable because, because we need to describe each one completely uh, with, with, with quantum mechanics. So there's a function uh, which goes from the set where these hidden variables take their values times r for time to r3 times r3 which are just the spin projection orientations of each component. So now, if we assume that these functions are absolutely deterministic, then a direct consequence of this is the fact that the orientation of the detector, each one of the detectors, is also encoded in up. Because this function, if it's going to give us these orientations, then the information has to be encoded here in that. And of course, a detector in a different orientation will have different values of lambda at earlier times. So we have an initial state, which is the singlet. We have a total uh, spin and then projection, uh, let's say, in a certain direction, z, for the spin of both particles. Uh, to start with, this is our initial state, and the final state is a certain ontological state in which both particles went up according to this evolution function which contains the orientation of the detectors, and we know what the total the, the square uh, spin of each particle is and the projection uh, along their, their uh, uh, respective angles. Um, determinism tells us that for, every given, for any given function, different outcomes of the function must come from different inputs. So different states at times, so let's say t1, <coughs> must come from different values of hidden variables lambda. And locality tells us that non-local correlations will emerge then from the deterministic evolution of a shared hidden variable in the past. As, as when I was mentioning to you the example of the socks or the example of having uh, both, both uh, apparatus uh, aligned in the same direction. So let's revisit uh, Bell's inequality. He shows that uh, given local hidden variables, a correlation must satisfy this inequality. In a deterministic scenario, we will have, for the case of orientations A and B, a certain one evolution function, particles which one of them leads to an apparatus oriented at angle A and the other one at angle B. Then we have another scenario in which one particle uh, goes to an apparatus uh, oriented at angle A and the other one to an apparatus oriented at angle C. And for this quantity here, there's a third scenario in which the evolution brings one particle, an apparatus oriented at angle B, and another one oriented at angle C. So each of these sets must come from different sets of hidden variable values. That is, if, if we're going to, to have an answer such as plus minus A, plus minus B, then the lambdas have to take values in a certain set, lambda 1, which is different from the set where lambda would take its values if we're going to get results plus minus A, plus, plus or minus C. 
And these, of course, will, will take values in a different set uh, if we're going to get results plus minus b plus, uh, and plus or minus c. And if we have that, then when we write these uh, expectation values as the integral of these products, then this would be the integral over the domain of, of, uh, of the possible values of the hidden variables where one would get the results for A and B. And this would be an integral over the domain where one, where one would get results for A and C. And these domains are not equal. So one cannot carry out Bell's next steps. One cannot factorize the A here and then put this together. So the inequality in a deterministic scenario could not be derived. Therefore, let me just give this uh, uh, sort of preliminary conclusion. The violation of this inequality by experiments does not show that the assumption of locality in this scenario is incorrect. <coughs> now, in order to build Bell's inequality, we would require the set of values of hidden variables to be one and the same. And if we want this requirement to be satisfied, then there are only two paths that we can take. One of them is that each scenario can be governed by a different function, a different evolution function. Or that on each different scenario, the measurement takes place at different time. So we would have the same, the same uh, evolution function, but different times of measurement for each one. Let me, let me follow the first path. The second one is similar. Uh, but let's follow the first, the first path. So here we have uh, three evolution functions for each of these different scenarios. One of them gives us results plus or minus A and plus or minus B, which is this one. The second one, which gives us plus or minus A, plus and mi or minus A and plus or minus C. And the same for the third scenario. So this, we would have values A1 depending uh, uh, on the orientation A and the hidden variables, which are just a, are just a sign of this, uh, uh, this image of the evolution function, the corresponding one, at the same time, D1. D1 would be the sign of this OB1, and A2, the sign of A2, and etc. And so when we write this uh, difference of uh, expectation values, then uh, we would get uh, this, uh, uh, this form, this functional form under the integral over the same set. And in order to be able to carry on to the next step, to factorize these, uh, these A's, these uppercase A's, then one would have to assume that A1 is equal to A2. And if we follow all, all of uh, uh, the steps that Bell followed, then these are the three assumptions that he makes. A1 must be equal to A2, B1 must be equal to minus A3, B2 must be equal to B3. So let us analyze this correlation with, within and without Bell's assumptions. So within Bell's assumptions, uh, what we would get is that the expectation value uh, of measuring at angles A and B is just minus the cosine of the difference in the angles. The same for A and C. But for B and C, we would get a product of cosines. And to see why this is so, uh, uh, the probability of getting either plus or minus 1 when we measure the spin projection of particle A is 1 half. And we don't know anything about it. So it has probability one half to go up and one half to go down. Let's say that it's plus one. Then the probability of getting plus one when we, when we measure the spin projection of particle B, we know if is the sine squared of the difference in the angle. And the probability of getting minus one is cosine squared of the difference in the angle, divided by two. So uh, this is summarized in this table. So if, uh, probability of A1 being 1 or minus 1 is a half. And given that it's 1, the probability of B1 
being 1 is sine squared, being minus 1 is cosine squared. If a is minus 1, then we have cosine squared here and sine squared there. And under the assumption that a1 is equal to a2, then b1 is equal to minus a3, we just substitute these two here, and we get this table here, which I will remind you of it later. Similarly, for the second experiment, uh, the probability of a2 being plus 1 is a half, being minus 1 is a half. And given that it's plus 1, the probability of b2 to be plus 1 is sine squared of the difference of the angle uh, between b and c. Minus 1 is cosine squared and the other way around. And then we use this, the third of uh, uh, Bell's assumption, and uh, b2 we replace with b3 and we get this table over here. So we have these two tables that we arrived at. So from these, the probabilities of a3 and b3 having the same sign is as follows. We have, uh, uh, remember that we have a minus sign here, a3. So if a3 is plus 1, if, uh, if minus a3 is plus 1, then the probability of b3 having the same sign, so we have to be minus 1, then it's just sine squared difference angle out of A and B uh, times cosine squared of the same difference. Uh, sorry, the difference in angles A and C. Or, or if, uh, if A2 is minus 1, then again, the difference would be cosine squared times sine squared <coughs> plus sine squared times cosine squared. And this is what is, what is just mentioned here. The probability of, of both of them having different angles, different signs, is just this sine squared times this sine squared, this plus this cosine squared times this cosine squared. And this is what is given here. And when we calculate the expectation value of the correlation between the two functions, then we get the probability of both having the same sign minus the probability of both having opposite signs. And this gives us minus the product of cosines. So this is how we arrive to this third equation. And when we plug it into uh, Bell's inequality, we get the, the absolute value minus cosine uh, of uh, the angle, uh, the difference in angle between A and B, plus the cosine of A and C uh, is less than or equal to 1 minus this product here. And this inequality is always satisfied by quantum mechanics and by any other theory that we know. Ten. So the above suggests that if the experiments were to satisfy the constraints necessary to build Bell's inequality, then the expectation values would be such that we arrived at this inequality, and this inequality is always satisfied. So the violation of Bell's inequality, as we see it by experiments, uh, does not show that uh, reality cannot be made in a local deterministic way. One can follow. Uh, the same procedure without using Bell's assumptions, and then we have different sets depending on, on, on what these values would be. This first set is, is exactly what Bell assumed, but then we also have A1 uh, b equal to A2, B1 to minus A3, but then B2 instead of being B3 is minus B3, and so on. So we build eight different sets. We can calculate uh, this integral for each one of the sets. And, uh, and what we get, this is just, uh, but for set one is exactly the same as we failed it. For set two, uh, this is only the procedure doing the, the appropriate substitution. And what we get is again uh, 1 minus the product of cosines times the, the volume, hyper volume of this set here where we are integrating. And when we normalize, we do, we do this for, for all lambda i, we normalize. Uh, the total volume, and once again we get we get this inequality. And again, this is always satisfied uh, by by any theory, and assuming no specific relations between functions. So for the second path, I'm going to skip it, but it's essentially the same. And uh, in conclusion, uh, we believe that local realism can be recovered from quantum mechanics that the usual application of Bell's inequality to experiments is not a proof of the non-local nature of reality. Uh, in, 
that in a local deterministic universe, wealth inequality cannot be derived when you rise uh, a similar uh, inequality, which I showed you. And this inequality which one derives is always satisfied by quantum mechanics uh, and thus by the known experimental results. Uh, so the further work would be to uh, again use this deterministic and local point of view to study the, the double slit experiment and to study the PBR theory that I mentioned before. Uh, this this uh, we, we are already doing, it is almost finished, and uh, uh, we get essentially the same, the same results. So thank you for your attention, and I will leave you with further reading. same color <laughs> and we see that this is big we know that this is big because it was set prior to the measurement yeah that's my point you, you are completely right I, I am not uh, nothing to say about that but my point is that the assumption is which we want to use in, in any theory to make predictions and in time by time the assumption is which is wrong not a prediction but the assumption you know, for instance, here, you are, to say in some uh, more scientific uh, way, let us think in a quantum number, which is the color of the sun. And you assume that there is a principle of conservation because the color of the sun is conserved, and also the number of the sun. Yeah? Assuming that, your prediction is that if there is nothing that changes <coughs> this principle of conservation, the next result will be that the result you, you, you require to fulfill this principle. Yeah? yeah. Okay. In the EPR uh, problem, for instance, in the version of a uh, bomb, what is the, the, the principle which is assumed here? that the total momentum is conserved, is preserved, yeah. in particular the spin. So that you start with a system which has no spin, and this uh, decays into different systems, and having one of them uh, spin on one half. Oh. So that if the principle of conservation is, is right, the next uh, spin is that. OK, but this is no more than a, a principle of, of conservation of, of momentum. Sure. And this holds also in classical practice. Yeah? Like the socks. Yes. The socks are classical. Yes. What's the difference here? What, what is 
quantum here is that you can change without breaking measurements the speed of this particle and verify if after that the same principle holds. If this holds, then this is a quantum phenomenon. If not, this is a classical one. This is my, my, my point concerning the source, that the assumption is very important in order to make the predictions. So that this is very important, you are very right that. Yeah? I'm not saying anything uh, different from what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, Essentially, yeah. Uh, when, you, when you vary the orientation of the detectors, then uh, you, have, uh, you have different statistics for, for uh, the results of going up and going down, which is what I showed you there. The, the, the quantum statistics, the statistics tells us that they go like sine squared and cosine squared of the difference in that. The classical statistics would be different, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm not saying that the results are not quantum or that the quantum theory is wrong. No, no, no. This preserves quantum theory. It's just, the idea is just not to avoid local hidden variables, but trying to be able to, to say uh, in a deterministic scenario, and if we want to preserve locality, one could still include local variables in quantum theory in order to complete it. Yes, yes. Your, your talk has been very clear. OK, OK. <laughs> I'm not again, but sure. okay. the next point you, you put on the table right now. Because the next point is about uh, causality and locality. You uh, tell us, rightly, that uh, it uh, is a result of uh, relativity. Yeah. The notion special. of locality, special relativity. So that this is fun because you know that Einstein, in 1905, published these uh, very famous papers concerning the uh, photoelectric effect and that concerning the determinant of light, which is the, the, the special light. But these two papers, you know, that uh, establish very different and opposite opposite uh, notions of what is light. Sure. Yeah. And uh, Einstein is established after that, after uh, Heisenberg or and what is no one else for the Copenhagen uh, interpretation, that uh, the right point is not that the experiment defines the state of the system, but uh, the theory defines what experiment will decide. This is the, the result of a discussion with Heisenberg in, in, after the uh, yeah. So that my, my impression is that not only concerning the talk, but concerning the, the philosophy of Einstein in, in, when he was an old man, is that he faced uh, the results of quantum mechanics. And he also realized that quantum mechanics is, is very strange and, and different from, from many. Yeah? So that he faced a situation in which uh, both of his theories about the behavior of light are in opposition. Yeah. And, and he preferred to take Maxwell and special relativity as the right one and not the other uh, possibility. Because in the chains, he had accept non-locality. He was also in opposition within his own theory of special relativity. So that this uh, philosophical point of view by Einstein uh, have a very big influence in all people, even both, of course, about what physics uh, must be. And this is why everyone, of course, try to look for locality and reality and so on. So that I finish with this uh, question. No? Your, uh, the title of your talk is also very interesting. It's very pretty. I, I love I think it's very daring. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, apologize for daring so much. But the question is, right, I, I, not, uh, I have no problem with uh, non-locality of quantum mechanics. Because you are not a, believer, a true believer in relativity. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, I am we, a, a true believer in quantum mechanics. Well, yes, 
I'm not saying that quantum <laughs> mechanics is wrong. I think it's a very precise theory, right? It's, uh, it's amazing that uh, we nowadays have been able to manipulate uh, uh, single atoms, single photons. We have cavities where one can trap, let's say, three photons. And, and, and you can assure that, uh, can assure anyone that, that, that you have only three photons and not four and not two. And you pass an atom, an atom through there, and, and you measure it, and you measure the, the change of phase in the in the wave function of the atom, and and, and, and then, then you derive at, uh, the number of photons that you have, and so on. And we have beautiful experiments of, of entanglement in very very remote places, and measurements here and there, uh, or uh, teletransportation, whatever. Uh, uh, not to mention uh, all all the different predictions. That Using quantum mechanics and, and uh, proved true, uh, this thing functions because it's got transistors in them, and these transistors work because of, of the tunneling. Effect. But we also have another theory, uh, which is relativity, which has been tested uh, also in very very fine limits. Nowadays, you can you can see the difference in clocks running. Uh, uh, one of them being 30 millimeters uh, above the other one, so the, the difference in the in the gravitational field is minute, and you can still measure uh, the, the the redshift of the two holes. And and it, the answer you get is exactly what's predicted by general relativity. So uh, and, and then we have of course the gravitational waves that uh, that, that we now have detected. Which were measured thanks quantum mechanics. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that they are wrong. Right? It's, it's just uh, that we are faced with these two theories. And uh, uh, they are both uh, very, very successful. Uh, but they don't talk to each other very well. Now, I don't believe that it's a question of whether you like one more than the other, or I like one uh, more than the other. But uh, uh, it is true that uh, when we do science, we are led by we have in our minds. And uh, uh, from all the work that, that I did previously in, uh, in uh, general relativity and gravity, uh, I, I am convinced that uh, all the dynamics of, of systems, any system that you like, all the dynamics are, uh, uh, are given by, by local variables. The geometry is what determines uh, the dynamics and geometry is local. Now, topology is global. Topology tells us other things. It tells us about the kinds of particles that we can have in a certain universe, for instance, but not about their dynamics. The dynamics is given by geometry itself. So that's why I'm, I'm a true defender of locality, and if, if I am answering your question. So <laughs> coming back to your question, the answer is I truly defend locality. Uh, only because what I've seen is that, uh, that geometry actually tells matter how to move. And actually many things that we believe or that we label with physics or as physics is not physics at all. It's just a consequence of the geometry of the manifold uh, that you're working with. Right? Many, many things. And if we go to the extreme, one would say it would be there is no physics at all. Physics should be called geometry. If, if physics means the studying of the dynamics of systems. <laughs> but again, this is going into the philosophical arena. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. We thank Professor. Just one very quick question. Yes, I'm here. What would you are interested in analyzing the companies expecting in this context? What would you expect to learn? Um, I haven't tackled the double, split, uh, the double slit experiment because I don't really know exactly how to, so on so far. But uh, uh, Feynman, in his, in his book of, of uh, lectures on physics, in the third volume, he says that the essence of the problem with quantum mechanics is the double slit experiment. And if we understand that, we understand everything. So uh, the idea would be to see uh, uh, exactly 
I mean, the, the answer is going to be what we know, right? This is interference phenomenon. But uh, if we treat it, if we do the calculations, assuming a deterministic scenario and assuming uh, local uh, dynamics, then that we would get exactly the same result. That, that, that would be all. I mean, the results that the experiments tell us. Uh, the other one uh, uh, that I mentioned, that the PBR theorem, I don't know if, if people here are, are familiar with it, uh, but uh, I don't know if I have time to very briefly mention this. What, what they do is uh, they have an apparatus that, uh, uh, that can create states uh, in either, let's say, let's say uh, let, let me call it zero or plus zero, zero being one type of polarization and plus being zero plus one over root two, square root. Um, and then they have another uh, apparatus identical to the first one. So they produce these particles and they mix them together and then they say, well, we have this state and uh, uh, which is a superposition of uh, zeros and pluses. And then they say, okay, I'm going to measure this state, but I'm going to measure it in in a basis which which is essentially uh, Bell's uh, Bell's basis, right? in, in, in a basis which is uh, which is not the, the usual up down or whatever. And they show that uh, uh, in these four bases, no matter in which one they measure, uh, one of the possibilities. Uh, has always probability zero of, uh, of uh, appearing, whereas the two apparatuses can produce this, this probability. And what they assume is realism, so they say, OK, uh, there's no realism. Okay. And uh, or they, they, they say that the wave, they, they have shown two things, realism and that the wave function is just information. So what they essentially say is the wave function is not mere information. One can actually measure it has to be an observable. This is their conclusion in their writing. But uh, because this is stronger, I prefer to say, OK, they assume there's no realism. There's no realism. And what we claim is that when you do this in this deterministic scenario is that in order to obtain the state that they claim to have obtained, they have to do a measurement beforehand on the apparatus before they mix it. Otherwise, they obtain a different state and if you take this different state and you measure it in Bell's basis, then all the probabilities are different than zero. So uh, this is this is the other uh, one. Sort of continuing with this lecture. The very last question, please. <laughs> On the other hand, we, uh, we have uh, Eisenberg box, which is a form of You can see it as a form of non-locality. You can also see it uh, even in a classical scenario. I mean, when, uh, when you take uh, when you take some data and uh, let's say a time series, and you take a Fourier, Fourier transform of the time series, uh, even if all the data are the same, you don't get one one peak, one delta function. You get a certain uncertainty. The uncertainty comes from, in this case, from the fact that your your time series is finite. If you would take an infinite time series, then you would get a delta function, but you don't. So you, you get this this curve, which is very very strongly peaked at the value where, where you should get it, but uh, that it has a certain uncertainty. Yeah. Now I think that uh, uh, Heisenberg's principle is something of that sort brought to the realm of quantum mechanics. Not necessarily about non credit. And also regarding the EPR, EPR paradox. Uh, so uh, you, you, uh, the argument is um, uh, at the level of plane waves. Yes. And the plane waves uh, are practically uh, unlocalized. Uh, 